I'm Rachel Woody, and I'm here with Marge Volstek, and it is July 9th, 2015, and we're here at her home next to Oak Knoll Winery in Hillsboro. And my first question for you, Marge, is why wine? Why wine? It all started back in the mid-60s. My husband and I were living in Beaverton. He was employed at Tektronics. We have six children, five sons and a daughter. Those six children were born in a period of seven years, no multiple births. So I was an extremely busy mother, uh, did a lot of canning, freezing, jam, jelly, relish, you name it. And all of a sudden I thought, well, why don't we make some wine? So I went to my husband and he says, fine, find a recipe. Well, back in the mid 60s, believe it or not, there were absolutely no recipes. The only thing I stumbled upon were some old English ones. Yeah and um, made our first gallon of wine, which happened to be blackberry as amateurs. It was a lot of fun, and believe it or not, it turned out just great. So we experimented, did more and more, went from my kitchen to my utility room. That wasn't large enough, so then we converted our garage into kind of an amateur home winery. Over the years, friends and relatives would taste it and say, gee, you should start a winery. I told you before I had six kids in seven years. Well, they were little, little steps. <laughs> and so I thought, you've got to be kidding us, start a winery. Well, we continued experimenting and a lot of interest was evolved. People thought, you've got to do this. So finally we decided, okay, we'll try. So first step, find a suitable location. Uh, my husband was working at Tektronix, so we had to be within the Tri-City area, Tri-County area. So we uh, looked around, finally stumbled on this old milking barn, milking parlor, that we started our winery in. But at first we thought, gee, it's so huge, we'll never fill it. It's hollow clay tile and cement, so it's ideal for wine baking and wine storage. So we took the big step bought the, that building, my house, and five acres all together from Ed Burkhalder. Uh, Mr. Burkhalder at that time had a big picture sitting over his, his couch that said Oak No Dairy. Mm. We looked at that and thought, oh my goodness, that would be just a perfect name for a winery. One time there used to be just dozens and dozens of oak trees on this property. Right now they're all across the street. But uh, I, he had a humongous big wood stove and I think he burnt up every oak tree on here. <laughs> but um, that's kind of how we came to be. And uh, it's been really exciting and interesting to see how the wine industry in Oregon has evolved over the years. Because when we started, there was only a few like mom and pop wineries. There was Hillcrest down in Roseburg. There's Honeywood in Salem, but other than that, there are like Henry Enders and Ma Bender Pioneer Homestead, wineries like that, that the, the smaller ones are no longer in business. And so uh, I still to this day think of the winery as my baby, because if I hadn't said to my husband then, let's make some wine, Oak Knoll would not be in existence today. How did you go about preparing yourself for that. I mean, I know you did experimenting and you found some recipes, but what else did it take? A lot of reading, research, short courses. Uh, as a, a few years after we were into the business, we would have a lot of the professors that were really interested in what the Oregon wine industry were, was doing come up from Davis in California. And of course, having five sons and, and, and a daughter and all five of the boys were in fact, my daughter, too, all six of them were doing things out in the winery, helping us, you know. We thought, well, we should send them there, but you, when you go to Davis, I think you almost have to be a graduate student before you're allowed to make wine, whereas here it was hands-on. Mm -hmm. So I believe you started out with berry wines, and then, of course, you've transitioned into others. Into the grape. When we, when we moved here and started the winery, we had every intention of buying land and planting grapes. Mm -hmm. But it so happened that a number of grow people that wanted to grow grapes approached us and said, please let us grow grapes for you. And we thought, 
well, we don't have the expense, we don't have the, you know, wear and tear on us, and we still mm -hmm. feel, unless you have a huge uh, amount of people to help you, it's hard to do both and do a top-notch job of it. Right. So when these people, you know, said, let us grow grapes, we thought, well, we'll give them a try. And we did, and it works out. We still have like Dion Vineyard and Shepherd mm -hmm. Vineyard and a few of those other ones that have been with us since almost day one that we purchase grapes from. And so uh, we go out into the vineyard, we check for sugar, acid, pH, the whole bit. Mm -hmm. And then we in turn tell the growers when to pick, they bring the grapes into us, and we do everything after that. So the only thing that's not done is, is uh, the actual growing. Mm -hmm. Although we do have some native North American Niagara's across the back there because you've got to have grapes around the winery for atmosphere. <laughs> we have a few up in front that don't amount to anything because honestly we're t with our location we're a little bit too low. I know Blizzard Winery has their grapes across the street but they're up high enough mm -hmm. that uh, they get a little bit more air and frost you know prevention from it so um, we're, we're very satisfied with where we are today for moving into the grapes did you decide oh we should do grape wine or was it really people coming to you no we wanted to do grape wine from day one mm -hmm. but let's face it in 1970 there were not established vineyards there in Oregon mm -hmm. and so that's why we went the route we made and the back in that time oh there's a lot of uh, most of the other wineries that were around with the uh, exception of Hillcrest were all making berry wines. Mm -hmm. So we just sort of stepped into that uh, with the idea that we were going to go branch into the grape wines as the grapes became available. Dion Vineyard, which is about three miles from here, uh, from, from day one uh, when they planted their grapes, Ron Johnson and his wife, they thought, okay, we've got a good home for them. And I remember Ron Johnson's dad, once the grapes came into production, he's a fine old gentleman. And of course, when you have a winery, you want to get tons and tons of grapes in it at the same time. Yeah. Well, he would drive this tractor with this little trailer on that would hold one or two totes, bring it across 219 and down here. And he just loved doing it. <laughs> so were you the primary winemaker for most of that time, or how did your evolution in the industry okay. happen? Okay, that's sort of jack of all trades. My husband was still working at Tektronix, and so I would get fruit in. I'd be out there at the other end of the building. Well, as it's getting dark, neighbors were probably wondering what in the world was going on. <laughs> would receive it, and then uh, after a couple of years, he left Tektronix and came on here. And so we, we sort of worked together, although he did more of the physical part of it, and I did the behind the scene, and uh, it worked out fine. And then, of course, the kids all came into this, because I think my oldest two were probably, they were going into middle school then, and mm -hmm. I had four right up the hill from here, Farmington View Elementary School, so. And you still have kids in the industry today, although they're not kids anymore. No, my oldest son, he's, I don't know if I can say, he's about to turn 59, so that tells you next month. He's a winemaker down in California. He's been there close to 30 years, and he loves it down there. Mm -hmm. He lives in uh, Calistoga. In fact, some of my friends laughingly call him the mayor of Calistoga, which he is not, because he knows so many people down there. And uh, he had worked at numerous wineries as a consultant and working, but he didn't want to be tied down. He's one that wanted to be free to move here and there. Well, about, oh golly, 15 years ago maybe, Arnold Tudal at Tudal Winery in, the, in Calistoga was finally able to corral him and ask him to please stay on as winemaker. Well, Arnold has since passed on and his son John does, does a, and, and my son Ron work together down there. And so that's where Ron is. John at one time, my son John was here, but now he's moved on to other things. Uh, Steve is now president and CEO of Saki One in Forest Grove. Tom has moved on to other things too. 
Doug is a um, winemaking team at Soko Blosser, mm -hmm. and my daughter Sarah lives over in Lapine, so she's not involved in the wine industry at all. So that's kind of all six of them. Yes. Did they ever think, gosh, Mom, you're crazy? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps, wow, you were visionary. You know, it was something, it was fun and it gave you such a good feeling of accomplishment, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when especially people would come in, you know, and taste the wines after we had our tasting room going. And our philosophy from day one, we wanted to make wine to please the people, not what we ourselves like. Mm -hmm. So our idea was to make a wine for every taste, a wine for every palate, and a wine for mm -hmm. every occasion. And I think we've pretty well succeeded over the years. We've branched out a little bit. We have a, a Oakno Wine Club now, and when you have uh, regular new releases coming out, you have to go a little bit further. So we have had to go to oh, Columbia Valley Appalachian and get some some uh, grapes that would fit into the big red category, mm -hmm. like Barbera, Cabernet, mm -hmm. uh, also Syrah. So yes, it's been really interesting. And of course, you weren't just involved in your own winery. We know that you've been involved in other things across the industry. Yes. What were some of those, and why did you decide okay, to get into it? Okay, back when we when we were all just starting out in Washington County here, we thought we need to group together. We have maybe a little bit more, I don't know, force or. <laughs> Uh, a little bit more publicity if we branch together. And so a few of the ladies, because our, our Washington County Winery Association has changed its name, it's revolved into the Northwest Vintners, and it's so many men now. <laughs> Whereas in the beginning, it was Virginia Fuller from Tualatin, Betty Coulomb from Cote de Coulomb, uh, Nancy Ponzi from Ponzi, myself, that was the first four, then uh, Mulhausen, Pat Mulhausen from Mulhausen joined in, Corinne Gross from uh, um, Cooper Mountain, mm -hmm. and that was kind of the, the leading force, and as time went on, when uh, Laurel Ridge was uh, in Washington County, David Tepala, he started coming to the meetings, and then some of the men finally did and it was in my living room here, and we kind of outgrew, outgrew it. And then as time went on, uh, it, it evolved and became larger. And now, now uh, there's even a few wineries that are not in Washington County that belong to the Northwest Bettners, mm -hmm. like Elk Cove and Kramer for two for sure that I know. Mm -hmm. And what was the, the purpose of that group, and has that evolved? Okay, one of our first ventures was we were trying to get some gimmick to bring people to the wineries. Fourth of July was our big thing. We had little brochures printed and things saying, taste a wine before it's time. Mm -hmm. We had our barrel tasting, and so we, that would draw people out. And then we kind of went from Fourth of July to Memorial Day weekend. And then as um, the years went by, even though we were joint, like through the, through different organizations and charitable things in the Hillsboro Forest Grove area, mm -hmm. we would promote them too and, and be involved through, through them. And so it has it's worked out fine. Now being one of the earlier pioneers, what was that like? I imagine daunting? Somewhat. I don't think we knew what we were getting into, into back in those days. We were all so young and innocent and, and didn't have any expectations except we wanted to promote ourselves and the surrounding wineries. That was it. And mm -hmm. we wanted people to be aware of Oregon making wine. Mm -hmm. I know there's a few stories I hear that like Bill Fuller when he was at Tualatin, he would go to New York and he'd have to tell them first of all where Oregon was, secondly Washington County, yes, and that we really did make wine here. So. And who were some of your early compatriots? I mean we always hear how collaborative the spirit was. Who were some of your go-to people? Okay, well, I don't know if you'd say go-to because we were kind of here before they were. The other two, the other two wineries that that came about about the same year we did, 
were, uh, was Dave Lett, Irie, and uh, Ponzi's. But we were actually selling wine before they were. Mm -hmm. And so, and of course they were growing grapes and we weren't, you know, so it's a little different level. But I know over the years we have helped out you know, other wineries. I know when Harvey Schaefer was starting Schaefer Vineyard, we crushed some of his grapes for him. Mm -hmm. uh, Elk Cove, if they would run out of something, Joe and Pat Campbell would, would you know, could we borrow or could we buy such, such and such that they needed for their wine production. Mm -hmm. And so I think everybody helped everybody back then. And they, we were competitive, but not, not that we would cut anybody else out. Being a woman in the wine industry, and especially one of the founding women, can I ask, did you feel any sort of sexist or any barriers because of that? If so, we didn't acknowledge it. <laughs> um, of course, I think everybody thought that the big industries, be it wine or something else, that it was the male that dominated. Mm -hmm. But uh, believe you me, the women were definitely there too behind the scenes maybe, but there. For starting the wine industry and perhaps even just winemaking, what has been sort of your philosophy getting you through this? Well, we just kind of take one day at a time, one season at a time. And of course, living here in Oregon, I mean, we have our ups and downs, you know. There's some years that were fantastic and some years that were not that great, but mm. we tried to um, bring everything up to par, even even things out. You know, mm. we wanted consistency above all things in the production of our wine. One thing I, I didn't say that my mother-in-law, she, she just could not believe, first of all, that we were going to make wine out of gorgeous things like those little itty bitty wild blackberries that grow up like in the Tillamook burn and everything. Mm -hmm. When we lived in Beaverton, there was some right across the street from, from where we lived. Go out there and pick them and she just thought that was a sin not to make jelly or oh. pies out of there, waste them on wine. That was that was one thing where <laughs> we, we begged to differ. Another mm -hmm. thing, our, our neighbors, one time we drove them crazy, had all the kids out we were making dandelion wine for the first time. Okay, you go, you bend over, you pick, and you just pull out the yellow part. You don't want the green or the bitter bit. And of course, after a while, your fingers get sticky. So here we are, bending over, shaking the yellow off. Finally, they stuck their head out and said, what are you guys doing? <laughs> making dandelion wine. Mm -hmm. We only made it once, so. Oh. <laughs> That does prompt another question specifically about the berry wines. Mm -hmm. Not just Oak Knoll, but many of the wineries when they got started after Prohibition ended. Yes. So, so how has that changed or why did it change to them? I think people's tastes have changed so much. They're so much more sophisticated now than what they were. I mean, before you made do with what was local, what was around. Mm -hmm. Like we did the Logan Berries, which mm -hmm. are almost uh, the, their disappearing breed. Boysenberries, Blackberries, and of course we think the Marion Berries a top-notch way to go on that. Back in the early days, we did rhubarb, red currant, gooseberry. In fact, when I say gooseberry, it brings to mind. We were looking for an inexpensive white wine to make. And so we thought, what's the French for gooseberry? So we came up with Rosé Blanc. And uh, we made it and put it on the label. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of doctors that liked, that lived locally, that liked it, but liked to fool their 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 guests. <laughs> so they would buy, buy this rosé blanc, which was gooseberry, and pour it, and they had no idea what they were drinking. They thought it was grape. <laughs> so that that sort of comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, rhubarb. Rhubarb was really, really popular. And uh, then it got to the point when the grapes came into production, we cut back on the fruit and berry and then kept our raspberry, which son Steve, when he was uh, our president here at the winery before he moved on, uh, 
he came up with the name Frambrosia from the, you know, the French raspberry and some, you know, an ambrosia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyhow, we kept that Frambrosia, which has won all sorts of awards all over. I mean, it has been, it's so intense and tastes just like the berries. And when we make that, we put a lot of berries and we do it in the 375s now and put at mm -hmm. least a pound of berries in each bottle. Mm -hmm. So it has that. If you don't like raspberries, you're not going to like. <laughs> you're not going to like that. And then people remembered when we had the blackberries. So within mm -hmm. the last, oh, I want to say ten years, eight, ten years, we brought back the blackberry. And we are try. We try whenever possible to get the Marion berry since it's uh, comes from Oregon mm -hmm. and. Uh, People like that. It's it's very good. It's a little softer, a little more subtle. It doesn't come on like gangbusters like our frambrosia does. So those are the berry wines that we have now. But everything else is is great. Wonderful. Vinifera and also your native North American like Niagara and Concord. I have to say your Niagara is my dad's favorite. It's a lot of people's favorites. You know, I tell people when they come in, people that as time goes on. They get their tastes become more sophisticated, and and they look, they turn their nose up, and look down on Niagara's and Concord as being second class mm -hmm. things. Well, they are a big part of of you know our production because people love them. If we were ever to quit making Niagara, I think they'd take us out to the nearest tree and lynch us because <laughs> they are so dedicated, you know, to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, those Niagaras are really easy to find, you know. And we have so many people come in and say, well, they'll taste the Pinot Noirs and the Chardonnays, Pinot Gris, etc. And they'll look at me and say, well, don't you have anything that tastes like grapes? Bingo! Yeah. There you go. You've got your you've got your Niagara. That's I laughingly refer to as adult grape juice. <laughs> that's a good brunch yeah. wine. It's really chilled. It's good deck patio sitting out with you know cheese crackers, salami, or something like that. So there there's a purpose in all of our wines. Mm -hmm. Do the difficulties vary between the berries and the grapes? Actually, berries are harder to get a perfect balance than what the grapes, because you take the grapes and you just, uh, well, the sugar acid pH is what determines the final outcome. Of course, Mother Nature, I mean, we can't forget that, you know. Each year is a little bit different. But when you come to the berries, uh, first of all, they're usually higher in acidity. Mm -hmm. And um, if you, you can't press them too hard, or you, you release excess tannins in there and you don't want that. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, you just gotta hit a, hit a happy medium. There's a perfect balance. I know there was a winery up in Washington, I think Bainbridge Island, that made three rhubarbs. They made one that was dry, one that was sort of down the middle, and one that was sweet. Well, two of those were sort of out of kilter because there's only one perfect balance when you, when you do that. Uh, years ago, before we started the winery, I worked for wine art, a uh, wine shop in Beaverton. In fact, I ran it till it got to the point after we started here, it was a little bit too much. And Ann and Jack McCallum talked to me and said, Marge, will you, well, he started out with Ron, wanted him, my, my husband, wanted him to teach winemaking to, through PCC. He did one class and he just gave up. He just did not. So for about three years, I taught adult education, wine beginning, very basic beginning winemaking. Mm -hmm. And I remember one fellow came in and he says, I found the perfect way to um, crush elderberries, you know, the little purple ones that go there. He says, put them in my blender and just blend them to death. I looked at him and I says, do you realize how much tannin is in there? It's going to, you either have to make a port or let it sit for 20 years before it's drinkable. So, you know, another, another case that comes to mind, somebody wanted to make cranberry wine. So he went out and bought cranberries and he tried everything to get that going. Well, you know, I said, did you use yeast nutrient? Oh, yes, I did this and that. Well, we came to find out that the, the commercial cranberries, they spray them with sulfur dioxide or something like that. So he had two strikes against him even before he trying to get it to ferment. Wow. So those are little things, that, tidbits that sort of pop in. Mm -hmm. so. Do you have a winemaking philosophy? 
make it as you like it for amateurs but for commercial I already said you know we like to please all people mm -hmm. All right, I'm Camille Weber, and I'm here with Marge Volstek, and we're doing the second part of the interview now. And my first question for you is, what was your most memorable vintage? Well, in 1983, at the Oregon State Fair, we won not only one governor's trophy, but two governor's trophies. One for the best vinifera wine, which was our 1980 Pinot Noir, and uh, I'm trying to remember if it was the Logan Berry. No, Logan Berry was a year before. I think it was the Raspberry, probably. Two Governor's Trophies, and the year before we had won one for the best fruit and berry wine. Uh, 80 was the year Andre Chalachev called, and I happened to answer the phone when he called, and uh, said, in all the years of tasting Pinot Noirs, I can't really quote him directly, but he said that ours was so outstanding, one of the best he'd ever tasted. And so that was a big thing, because back in that day, Andre Chelichev was, was big, huge. And so that was a big honor. But even though our 81, I th always liked our 79 a little bit better. So well, again, that? that, you know, um, why did you like the 79 better? It was it just, just tasted better to me. Mm. But he liked the 80, and if he'd tasted the 79, he might have liked that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, it's all in the eye of the beholder. You know, everybody's taste is so different. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and in 1981, you were actually involved with the tax increase on, um, on grapes. How did that affect um, the wineries and the vineyards around here and your winery? Okay, it did affect us, but back in that day, they had uh, like anything 40,000 gallons and under, we weren't taxed. So we were not that big back then. So it, it, it hurt a little bit, but only when you go over 40,000 gallons. But we knew that the Oregon wine industry needed help. And so if you get a little extra money that you can put toward maybe research or making things go smoother, so be it. Mm -hmm. Were there any wineries or vineyards that were affected by that, that were a little bit bigger, or were most of them? Most of us were smaller then. Right. Now there's a lot bigger. Uh, back in 1978, when there were very few wineries in the state of Oregon, it was found through records that Oak Knoll sold one out of every three bottles of wine, of Oregon wine in the state. So that was a good honor for us. That was before the hundreds and hundreds of other wineries came forth. So. Still a pretty big accomplishment. Yes, it was. <laughs> and back then we made more wine because you don't make wine unless you have a market for it. Right. It's different when there's eight to 10 wineries and now that there's 600 plus wineries in the state, you know, you gear your production to what you feel you can easily sell. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, when we first started out selling our wine, we did it ourselves, we marketed it ourselves. Then we went with Lemma Wine Company for a very short time, uh, but they didn't have the, uh, the wide outreach that other, other distributors did. Al Juicy, uh, Al C. Juicy Wine Company came to us. In fact, it was really weird. We couldn't figure this out. We'd go to deliver wine and all of a sudden they're saying, here, have this extra shelf space. Well, that's unheard of in this day and age. They were wooing us unbeknownst to us. And so we went with them and we were with them until, uh, well, it was really the same company, but a lot of different names, Al Juicy and then Valley Wine Company, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of a Gallo run organization. And then, but they, but they liked us, they accepted us. <laughs> and then we went, let's see, then, then Valley sold to Mount Hood Distributing. So we were with Mount Hood. Then Mount Hood in turn sold to Odom Southern. And then a couple of years ago, we made a break. We felt like we weren't getting the help that we needed, so now we're with Young's, and they, they handle our local, and they do do some distribution for us nationwide. 
So that's kind of how we went to delivering it to the wine shops and grocery stores. I know one of my sons used to take, you know, cases and cases over to Safeway Warehouse on the other side, you know, and then they would distribute it through there. But that was when there weren't nearly as many wineries as there are now. So earlier you talked about the importance of making wine for a populace. Yes. So how did your marketing strategies evolve? Uh, since you started and current now well we have a little experience behind <laughs> us <laughs> but uh, the people's tastes have changed so much back in in the early days they were more oriented to like Annie Green Springs and and some of those other ones that were a little sweetness to them but not really sweet and were marketed for out of probably California or New York, most of them. But we thought everybody's palate is different. What you like and what I like and the person next door likes can be completely different. There's no right or wrong when it comes to your likes. I mean, it's very personal. What you like, you go with. So I don't think it's changed a whole lot that way. <laughs> Now that you're retired and you've seen the industry grow and develop over the years, where do you see the future of Oak Knoll going? And maybe expand that picture a little bit more. Where do you see the Oregon wine industry going? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's just going up, 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 up. As far as Oak Knoll, we have uh, our own philosophy and we still think of the people, the average person that comes in. We would like to make what you consider the, the gourmet premium top of the line, $80, $100 bottles of wine, but let's be practical. I mean, the average person, it's more like a Fred Meyer taste, you know. It's, it's not low end, it's not high end, it's right through the middle. Good quality consistency, that's what we want to do. We do have an Oakno Wine Club. We have so many dedicated members to that and uh, they would be crushed if we changed what's going on now. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and with, um, I know a lot of California vineyard owners are mm -hmm. growing their grapes here and it's kind of posing a little bit of a threat to some of the Oregon wineries, especially the smaller ones. Smaller ones, ones yeah. Um, so how do you think that'll affect Oregon as the industry continues to grow here? Will the identity um, of the place change or? What are your we hope it won't change, at least here at Oak, no, it won't change. But overall, there's a lot of people that come in that are dreamers and only dreamers, and they don't have the practicality, you know, behind them. Right. And they come and go. I mean, I can count on two hands of wineries that I know that used to be that are no longer, that have just completely closed down or sold to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I, you've got to have dreams and goals, but I mean, you've got to be realistic about all this. Okay. So if you had one thing that you would do over again, starting from the very beginning um, all the way to now, what would you change um, during your journey here? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> Ours has been successful. And, well, of course, when we started, we have no, had no idea what was going to happen. In 1970, when we started, we had no, we couldn't even begin to think what would happen to the Oregon wine industry, how it would explode. And I don't know if you ever reached a saturation point, because there's more and more people that are, are turning to wine now. Wine is much more popular than it was when we started. So it's hard to say if there's anything I would change. Just let the good Lord and Mother Nature take its course. Oh, well, fantastic. Um, so that's all the questions I have for you, but is there anything that I've forgotten? Anything that you would like to add? Oh. <laughs> You don't have to. <laughs> it's just I'm optional. thinking, after you leave, I, I, I'll think, oh, gee, I should have said this or that. But no, it, it's been a very rewarding. My, my only regret now is that I don't, I'm not as useful as I used to be. You know, when you're, when you're younger, you have, you know, so much more stamina and this and that. And now you just... Well, anyhow, I feel like a proud mother and the winery is another child. 
And that child has done very well over the yes. years. All right, well, I think that'll conclude our interview. Thank okay, you so much. Okay, you're welcome.